happy Saturday, everybody. It is May 23rd. And on this day in 1860, Phineas Gage was buried. His actual death date is a little bit unclear. This seemed like a good time to revisit our old episode on him, which originally came out on September 11th, 2013. And that was right before the 165th anniversary of the accident that made him famous. Just a little heads up here, there is a fair amount of detail about a traumatic brain injury in this episode, including uh, descriptions of the injury itself and how doctors of the day treated it. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today we have a, a massively popular listener request. Yeah, it's one of our most requested of all time. Yeah, so many people have asked us about to talk about Phineas Gage. And we are coming up on the 165th anniversary of the accident that made him and his brain famous. So here we go. It's finally, happening. We're finally going to talk about him. <laughs> So today, it's pretty close to common knowledge that different parts of your brain have different functions and and responsibilities. And this was far from the case back in 1848, when an explosion sent an iron rod through Phineas Gage's head, destroying his left frontal lobe. Unlike anyone else in known history who had ever experienced such a catastrophic brain injury at that point, he lived, although altered, for more than 11 more years. Over time since then, he's kind of morphed into one of the world's most famous case studies in how damage to the brain can affect behavior, some of which is legit and some of which is made up. So we will talk about that in more detail. I'm holding back my desire to talk about Futurama. Okay. And Fry's messed up brain. But anybody who watches Futurama knows what I'm talking about. Uh, So we don't really know much about Phineas, though, before his accident. No. Uh, Before he got put on the map by the spike his life really wasn't recorded. Uh, We know he was 25 on September 13th of 1848 when the incident happened. And at the time, he was the foreman of a railroad crew, uh, and they were at that time working on the bed for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad. He was, in the words of a letter written by his doctor to the editor of the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal in 1848, quote, of middle stature, vigorous physical organization, temperate habits, and possessed of considerable energy of character. He was also a good foreman with a good reputation, and he was competent at his job and really good at managing the crew, who were all pretty fond of him. And as you can imagine, uh, building a railroad, particularly at that time, was a really heavily manual process. When they had to cut through a hill, the crew would have to blast their way through rock, and one group of men would be preparing for the charge to be laid, and another had to be ready to clear away the rubble that happened afterward. And as foreman, Phineas was responsible for the overall operation uh, of these activities, and he was the one who was in charge of making sure the detonations went as planned, which he had been doing without incident. He was successful until that fateful day. Right. So while they were blasting through rock, Phineas used a tamping iron. This was an iron rod that was 43 inches long, one and a quarter inches in diameter, which one end of it tapered to a point that was a quarter inch in diameter. And it weighed 13 and a quarter pounds. So this thing was longer than your typical baseball bat. And it was made of iron. And first, they would make a hole. And they'd put gunpowder into the bottom of this hole. And then uh, Phineas would use the pointed end of his tamping iron to put the fuse into place. And they'd fill the rest of the hole with soil, and then he would use the broad end of the iron to tamp down the dirt before they lit the fuse. He and his crew were working on a stretch of track near Cavendish, Vermont, which is a town that had about 1,300 people. Walton H. Green described where this happened, and it could actually describe two different cuts along the track, so we're not sure precisely where it happened, but we've got it narrowed down. So he said, at the second cut south of Cavendish, where many potholes in the rock give indisputable evidence that Black River once went this way, near where Roswell Downer built his lime kiln later. I love that method of giving direction. (laughs) Later on, there would be a lime kiln, but it wasn't there at the time. (laughs) Uh, When the accident happened, they had made the hole and already poured the powder in, but they hadn't covered it up with sand yet. So while he was getting ready to tamp it down, Phineas turned his head away from what he was doing. 
And it seems as though he wrongly thought the gunpowder had already been covered with sand, but of course, as we said, it had not. And he lowered the rod to tamp it down and hit the rock, and it made a spark. And at that point, the charge exploded. The tamping iron flew upward. It entered under his left cheekbone and traveled through the roof of his mouth and behind his eye, through his brain, and out his skull, completely. I I was misunderstanding this in my earlier, like my knowledge, pre-podcast knowledge of this. I sort of thought it had lodged lodged somewhere. No, no. It traveled completely through his head and landed several yards away. So this destroyed his skull in several places, along with obviously part of his brain. It also pushed against the back of his eyeball. So his eye was sort of protruding a little bit. He lost a whole lot of blood from the resulting face and scalp wounds and the damage to the vessels that were inside of his brain. And I, I want to go back and look because I think similar to how you had the vision of it being lodged, uh-huh. I always had a vision of it being a spike from above. No, and I think yeah. there might have been a drawing or a piece of art at some point that was attributed as being Phineas Gage that someone drew Mm -hmm. that might have had it that way. Because I have the same image in my head of it being a lodged thing. Yeah, my understanding of this whole accident was completely incorrect before (laughs) I learned more about it. It it came up from underneath, under his his cheekbone. Yeah. I know, it's it's crazy. (laughs) And in the words of a news article in the Boston Post, which was picked up from the Ludlow, Vermont Free Soil Union, quote, the most singular circumstance connected with this melancholy affair is that he was alive at two o'clock this afternoon and in full possession of his reason and free from pain. Just let that sit there for a minute. Going. I know. (laughs) So not only did he live through this experience, he may not have even lost consciousness, although there was a lot of dust and debris following the the explosion that had to settle before people got to him. If he did lose consciousness, it was really brief. He was able to sit upright in the cart while being taken to town for a doctor. And once he got there, he was able to walk with, you know, with some help up the stairs, which is also stunning. Yeah. I can't imagine who volunteered to help him. You know what I mean? Can you imagine like the I don't I don't want to do it. Well, he was yeah, he was kind of he was a favored yeah, a favored boss by the crew. They were all fond of him and uh it, I think it they did, it had to have been a bit gruesome. It was definitely gruesome. It's going to get more gruesome. So if <laughs> if you are tender of stomach, let's just say that this may you may want to just fast forward. Brace for impact, have a friend screen it first. Yeah. Something cuz it does get really gross. Yeah, I I skip over some bits that are particularly <laughs> disgusting because it got to a point when I was reading the the day by day notes of what happened is kind of gross. Yeah. It'll make you squirm. It will. Uh so in town Phineas went to Joseph Adams Inn, you know, his tavern, and the town's doctor, Dr. John Martin Harlow, wasn't available right away. They couldn't find him. So someone rode to another nearby town to summon their doctor, who was Dr. Edward Williams. And once Williams got there, Phineas was feeling well enough to say, well, here's work enough for you, doctor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So about an hour later, Dr. Harlow got there. He and Dr. Williams conferred with each other and eventually decided that Dr. Harlow would be the one to treat Phineas. And here's a side note. I, we've kind of beat this into the ground at this point, so if you're tired of hearing it, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the whole thing was so horrifying and improbable that neither of the doctors nor a reverend who happened to see them going by on the way to get the doctor believed what, they, what the crew told them had happened. They were like, no way, that is impossible. What you were saying cannot have just happened. Um... They didn't believe it until they saw the rod in the scene of the accident where there was blood and brain matter everywhere. And our knowledge of the brain wasn't the only thing that was vastly different in 1848. Uh, Medical practice was at a completely different point of its evolution. And the germ theory of disease had not really happened yet. It was still to come. So many doctors were treating illnesses by balancing humors because they didn't realize the issues of germs and bacteria and contamination. Dr. Harlow specifically had graduated with his MD from Jefferson Medical College in 1844, although he probably also studied at Castleton Medical College in Vermont and the Philadelphia School of Anatomy before he went to Jefferson. His medical practice was often focused on 
uh, antiphlogistic principles. And today that just means anti-inflammatory, but at the time it was this body of ideas that uh, disease came from various sources of overstimulation or excess, which needed to be balanced in order for the person to be cured. So a lot of common techniques were bleeding, cupping, uh, applying leeches, and giving people laxatives and emetics to make them throw up. Uh, Dr. Harlow actually credited how much blood Phineas had lost at the scene of the accident um, with helping him to eventually recover. Uh, And the way he described described this was, quote, may we not infer that this prepared the system for the trying ordeal through which it was about to pass? It's an interesting medical concept. Yeah, well, and there's like a tiny piece of truth to it. The fact that he had this open injury instead of it like being a closed injury yeah. and like his brain had room to swell without right. it putting pressure on itself. Like that actually is true. Uh, but probably the massive blood loss did not in fact make it easier overall for his body to heal. Yeah. And Dr. Harlow also was a follower of phrenology, uh, which you may have heard of. It's that concept that the different parts of the skull relate to different parts of a person's character. Yeah. And that was a really common belief at the time. Yeah. Uh, every, People have probably seen those pictures of skulls that have the little um, grid lines drawn around them and they're labeled with what their particular area pertains to in the person's uh, behavior or personality. Right. There were no antibiotics or surgical disinfectants then, and hand washing before a medical procedure was not even a standard practice. So most of what Dr. Harlow did was to clean out obvious dirt, like loose brain tissue and bone fragments out of the wound, Um, And to try to replace the biggest pieces of the top of the skull, sort of put them back in place, um, and then close up the scalp and bandage the whole thing. He also treated and dressed some pretty extensive burns on Phineas's arms and hands. Uh, Everyone had been so distracted by the dramatic facial and head injury that they didn't notice those injuries at first. But of course, this was an explosion-related injury, so it makes sense that he would have had other damage. Right. During the first few days after his injury, Phineas did surprisingly well. I mean, he was definitely very ill, uh, but he continued to ask after the work on the railroad. He would ask who was acting as the foreman while he wasn't there. He also declined to see his friends, saying that he would be back at work in a day or two, so he didn't really need to have visitors. Um, The bleeding gradually slowed, and he was more or less able to sleep. But then he started to develop abscesses and fevers, and the wound became fetid. Dr. Harlow's response was to balance the humors, prescribing emetics and laxatives, as well as silver nitrate to treat what he described as, quote, fungus, which may have actually been fungus coming from the brain. Which is pretty disgusting. Yeah, I mean, you it's not a short walk to presume that uh, a wound of this nature, treated in the manner it was, would have some infection issues. Yeah. He also bled Phineas and drained the pus from the wound, both of which were motivated by this idea of getting rid of the excess and balancing the humors. But uh, of all the things, they may have been of actual real medical use in this case, since they would have reduced some of the pressure going on inside of his skull and, in the case of the pus, removed infectious material from his body. And Phineas had been able to see a little out of his left eye for a while after the accident, but he did eventually lose all sight in it, along with the ability to open it. So it kind of permanently shut. Right. He got a lot worse before he started to get better. And at some points, he was nearly comatose. In September, his friends and family went ahead and picked out a coffin and decided what clothes they were going to give, uh, they were going to put on him to be buried in. And at least one of the people attending him said that they should stop treating him since it was just prolonging the inevitable. But eventually, he started to rally. And changes in his behavior began to be apparent while he was still under Dr. Harlow's care. For example, on October 11th, Dr. Harlow offered him $1,000 for some pebbles that he had collected, and Phineas refused. A little later in October, when he was really starting to improve pretty steadily after that, you know, dramatic downturn, he decided he was ready to go home. And he planned to walk there. It was 20 miles away. So he went out shopping for some provisions he was going to need, and he did so in bare feet with no coat on. So remember, this was Vermont. 
This exposure set him back a little bit, but by the end of November, he was able to go home to his family. So obviously he was having some judgment issues at right. that point. He, you know, would turn down a large sum of money for... For some rocks. For some rocks, which who wouldn't want to take... I would take $1,000 for pebbles right now. Uh, and then he'd put himself in danger kind of thoughtlessly. Yeah. But Dr. Harlow attended to him for 10 weeks, uh, and then Phineas went home to Lebanon, New Hampshire, by carriage, and he stayed until April, continuing to recuperate. So, of course, one of the things, uh, I mean, apart from having his brain partially destroyed by a giant iron rod, one of the things that he is really famous for is for the change in behavior that came afterwards. Um a lot of this is portrayed as like he just became unable to work and unable to hold a job, and that's not really accurate. His recuperation did continue to be pretty slow, even after he left Dr. Harlow's care, but he really wanted to get back to work, and he started working uh, on his parents' farm. By the middle of the following year, which was 1849, he was barely able to do a whole day's work there. So even as he was recovering seemingly pretty well physically, his personality had changed. And we described him before the accident as being very smart, competent, and reliable. Uh, But after the accident, Dr. Harlow described him as fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which had not previously been his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible." A child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. So most of what we know about uh, Phineas's behavior after the accident comes from Dr. Harlow. And there's a little bit of question today as to whether this account is entirely reliable. His belief in phrenology might have colored his perception of Phineas's behavior, especially considering that some of his writings about him include specific phrenological terms, such as nervobilious. But regardless, uh, even his friends and acquaintances were saying that he was no longer Gage. Uh, Consequently, when he felt physically ready to return to work again, his old employer wouldn't have him back. There's a lot of popular writing about him today that sort of characterizes him at this point as a completely unreliable, unemployable, violent drifter. Um, This is completely inaccurate. He did find steady work after he recovered, although that work did not involve handling explosives anymore. Which would make sense. (laughs) (laughs) He went to Boston for a while in 1850, where he was under the observation of Henry J. Bigelow of Harvard, and he he was presented at the Boston Society for Medical Improvement and to a medical class at the hospital. And Dr. Bigelow also made a life cast of Phineas's head, showing the outward physical damage that was still evidence even once the initial wounds had healed. He spent some time at Barnum's American Museum in New York City and gave a couple of lectures and exhibitions about his accident in the Northeast sometime in the early 1850s. And this seems to be sort of the the total of his public display. Like, sometimes people say that he traveled around with a freak show and he became this freak show performer. Um, And that seems to be an exaggeration of what was more a couple of uh, exhibitions or lectures that he was in. And in early 1851, he was hired by Jonathan Courier to work at a livery stable in New Hampshire. And he worked there for about a year and a half. Then in August of 1852, a man who was starting a new carriage company hired him to come work with him in Chile. Uh, Phineas worked in a stable and drove a stagecoach in Chile for about seven years. And we've talked about how demanding the job of a stagecoach driver is in our recent episode about Charlie Parkhurst. So it seems as though, contrary to some of the popular writing about him, he did recover some of his mental abilities or at least adapt to life without them. Um, It may even be that the really routine work of driving the the same stagecoach route day after day after day gradually helped his brain adapt. And eventually, as his health began to fail, he went out to San Francisco, uh, where his family had moved in pursuit of the gold rush. He was pretty sick when he got there, but he recovered somewhat and was able to work for a while on a farm in Santa Clara. Uh, 
But then he had a series of seizures. They got more and more serious, and he died in May of 1860. He was buried on May 23rd of that year. And there was no top, there was no autopsy. Uh, but in 1867, his body was exhumed and his skull and the tamping iron were sent to Dr. Harlow. And Dr. Harlow eventually sent those to the Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard, which already had Dr. Bigelow's life cast. So you can actually see all three of these things at the Warren Museum Exhibition Gallery at the Countway Library of Medicine. Thanks to this skull and a lot of modern imaging work, today we have a much better idea of the exact extent of Phineas's injuries, especially where the rod went besides the obvious through his head. His skull was damaged in multiple places uh, that you would expect, under the cheekbone, at the back of the eye socket, and the top of his head. And so he lived for the rest of his life with parts of his skull Missing entirely, uh, including a pretty significant size patch from the top of his head. A number of researchers have tried to tackle the question of exactly how the rod traveled through his head and brain, and exactly what parts of his brain were damaged. Uh, Because some of the holes that were in his skull were smaller than the diameter of the rod, which like the one under his cheekbone was smaller than the rod was, and then the one at the top of his head was a lot bigger— Um, A lot of their findings didn't really agree with one another until we developed tools like CT scans to look at the skull itself um, and MRIs of living people's brains to create kind of a model for what gauges might have looked like. In 2004, researchers used CT scans of the skull to create a 3D representation of uh, Phineas's skull to try to determine exactly where the damage occurred. And their conclusion factors in that some of the bone at the entry wound must have moved out of the way almost like a hinge and then closed back down and later healed over, since the entry wound on the skull under the cheekbone is smaller than the rod itself. In 2012, a team of researchers led by John Daryl Van Horn published a paper called Mapping Connectivity Damage in the Case of Phineas Gage. It used all kinds of medical imaging techniques to map out exactly which parts of the brain would have been damaged. And this is where they used MRIs of other patients to to sort of work up a model. Their findings are in PLOS 1, so you can read them online for free. And at this point, most of the modern computational studies agree that the damage was really confined to the left frontal lobe. Phineas became really famous in the world of neuropsychology. Today, he's a case study in many, many psychology and neuroscience textbooks in chapters about how an injury to the brain can change a person's personality. But a lot of the writing about him today really sort of retroactively gives his story a lot of credit for everything from lobotomies to how doctors diagnose tumors in people's frontal lobes uh, based on changes in their behavior. But a lot of this is really hindsight, and sometimes it's kind of pulled out of thin air. Yeah, There's a little bit of making things up going on. So his accident, the fact that he survived it, and the fact that he basically recovered and lived for more than 11 more years— All of that definitely contributed to the fields of neurosurgery and neuropsychology, and and they were on their own pretty incredible. He really was long dead by the time surgery and sterilization techniques progressed to the point that neurosurgery was even a survivable event. And a lot of the writing about him also ascribes what we later learned about lobotomy and brain tumor patients to Phineas himself, sort of applying other people's behavior after the destruction of their frontal lobes to Phineas's behavior when he lived. But these descriptions, uh, which we mentioned before, that he became violent and shiftless and couldn't hold a job, they just don't match up with the descriptions of people that actually examined him and people that were around him. He kind of gets conflated with descriptions of other patients with completely different conditions that also involved their frontal lobe in some way. Yeah, their symptoms get attributed to his behavior or um, ascribed to his behavior when they weren't really going on. Yeah. A lot of people also cite him as one of the patients who helped neurologists figure out that different parts of our brains do different jobs. And this definitely was not the case at the time. Um, Doctors really knew very little about the brain, and there were two contradictory and competing theories. One was that the brain was basically this undifferentiated thing with all of the parts of the brain able to handle any task. And the other, which included the phrenologists that we've talked about before, believed that different locations in the brain had different functions. 
Both of these groups claimed that Gage was supporting their theory. The people who thought that the brain could uh, do anything from any part were like, well, he survived. Clearly, all the other parts of the brain made up for it. Um, And the people who thought that the different parts of the brain had different functions were like, well, his behavior changed. So clearly, he supports our theory. Um, So... (laughs) This did add to the whole field uh, and the whole world of things that we know about the brain. But there are other doctors and other patients who actually had a much bigger impact on this idea that, uh, that different parts of the brains do different things. In particular, Dr. Carl Wernicke and Dr. Paul Broca, who each worked with patients who have, uh, had damage to specific areas that affected their ability to use language. So Wernicke and Broca have parts of the brain named after them based on their research. Um, without those kind of developments, we, we could not have jumped to the idea that different parts of the brain did different things just based on Phineas Gage's case. Right. And we do have a couple pictures of Phineas Gage. Uh, vintage photo collectors Jack and Beverly Wilgus acquired one somewhere along the line. Yeah, they don't really remember where. <laughs> they put it on Flickr in 2007, and eventually Internet Chatter identified it as likely being Gage. And this was eventually confirmed by matching the photo to the life cast that's at the museum. And Gage's family released another picture in 2010. The life mask of Phineas's head and his skull and the tamping iron are all at Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard Medical School. The rod has this inscription. This is the bar that was shot through the head of Mr. Phineas P. Gage at Cavendish, Vermont, September 14, 1848. He fully recovered from the injury and deposited this bar in the museum at the Medical College of Harvard University. Uh, And then there is a name and, and some other dating. So what's funny... There's a couple funny things about this. One is that uh, his name is spelled wrong, and the other is that the date is wrong. And exactly how this all came to be is kind of lost to history. At some point, he gave the rod to Harvard's Medical School Museum, and then he asked for it back in 1854. But the inscription is dated 1850. So this all sort of, in addition to being kind of weird and misspelled, it calls into question this uh, frequent thing that you may hear about Phineas, which is that he carried the rod around with him forever after the accident. Clearly, he He did did not not. do that. Um, But clearly, he also (laughs) did want it because he asked for it back from Harvard. So that's a little uh, unclear at this point. There's also a commemorative plaque in the Cav- in Cavendish, Vermont, uh, and it was unveiled on September 13th of 1998, which was the 150th anniversary of Phineas's accident. There's also the book, uh, An Odd Kind of Fame, Stories of Phineas Gage by Malcolm McMillan. It's not the only book about him, but it came out in, in the year 2000, and it gives a really thorough history of Phineas and the accident Um, And it debunks a lot of the popular perception of him and his life and how he behaved afterward. So it is, I think, the most thorough work on him that you can get in one place today. Yeah, which is good because there's a lot of mythology that's grown. And I understand how that happens. It's such a bizarre, phenomenal thing. Yeah. It's easy to then accept some other pretty incredible uh, details about the story. Right. Well, and it's uh, it's one of those stories that now it's it's almost as interesting for how it became this sort of neuroscience juggernaut uh, as for the actual accident that happened. So, yes. Fascinating. Phineas Gage, 165 years ago, <laughs> a tamping rod had a little accident <laughs> through his, his entire skull. Y- yeah, that's wild. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 